In the sixth grade, I downloaded the popular app Pinterest. At first, I mostly just wanted to use it for artistic reference, but it was too easy to get lost in the vast sea of inspiration, inspirational quotes and text posts. One day, my long hours of scrolling landed me on a board called feminism, a term I wasn't quite familiar with. A quick Google search returned that it simply meant believing that men and women are equal. In my search for more information, I found that in any discussion about feminism, there's talk about waves. In the first wave, starting in the 19th century, this is, it was not the first time that we see feminist ideals in history. However, it was one of the first times that women in the Western world unite to demand rights, focusing on voting rights, which were achieved with the passage of the 19th Amendment. However, voter suppression, like literacy tests and poll taxes, made it difficult for lower class women and black women to vote. And Native Americans didn't gain the right to vote until the passage of the Snyder Act of 1924, more than four years after the 19th Amendment. The civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s gave rise to a second wave of feminism. Society limited women to a place within the home, cooking, cleaning, caring for the children. Second wave feminists demanded not only political, but social equality between men and women. It is during this wave that we see a divide start to form within the movement. Many of the priorities of women of color did not line up with that of mainstream feminists, and some black women began to stray away and created womanism, term coined by author Alice Walker, defined as a social theory based on the history and everyday experiences of black women. As a middle school girl, I didn't think much about identifying as a feminist because the Google search from that day seemed like a simple enough definition. It wasn't until I learned about the third wave of feminism that I found a part of the movement that truly interested me. It's during this wave that the term intersectional was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a word that highlighted how one's different aspects of their identity, like race and gender, contribute to oppression. This brings us to present day. Some call it the fourth wave. Some have abandoned the wave metaphor altogether. With social media, feminism has a spotlight like never before. The hashtag MeToo movement is an excellent example of how social media has helped propel the feminist movement. But if you take a deeper look into actual feminist circles, you'll find a variety of terms that these people identify with. Black feminists, intersectional feminists, and womanists being a few. So what gave rise to these micro divides? Oxford Dictionary defines feminism as the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. We see the simple definition all the time, from Instagram infographics to I stand with her hoodies. At your local Forever 21, you'll find a plethora of merchandise with labels like feminism or catchy slogans like the future is female. This emphasis on girl power and empowerment of women is a beautiful thing. And seeing it so prevalent on social media creates a space where girls can feel secure in themselves. However, the commodification of feminist beliefs can leave our words empty. Much of the feminism you see in mainstream media can be boiled down to what many refer to as girl boss feminism or choice feminism. The belief that any decision a woman makes is empowering simply because she makes it. Sounds great, right? Unfortunately, not for everyone. Choice feminism failed to acknowledge many of the struggles that women of color and lower class women go through. And the divide that we watch form throughout history grew deeper. The watered down definition of equality for all made lower class women and women of color have a hard time identifying with the term feminist. So they created their own terms, or don't identify with one at all. Choice feminism failed to acknowledge how many women have disproportionate opportunities, or how racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and transphobia contribute to the everyday lives of minority women. A few months ago, I read a book called Can We All Be Feminists? A collection of essays written by women from all walks of life, discussing their relationship with the term feminist. One essay that stood out to me was called 100 Small Rebellions written by a Punjabi woman named Isha Kaur. She writes about the cultural gaps that exist between mainstream feminism and the feminism she believed to identify with, the term never really resonating with her culture. Like many women, Isha Kaur's first example of feminist in her childhood was through her mother, who pushed against patriarchal Punjabi values that favored sons over daughters and ensured that Kaur did not grow up with the be seen, not heard ideals. Much like Kaur, my mother was my first example of feminism in my childhood. She refused to give up her career to raise three children, and as I grew up, she reminded me how important it was to have my own career and be able to support myself. 
the youngest of three, she was the first to get a college education. Despite our cultural differences, I found myself relating to Cor's experiences because of my experiences with my mom, who always taught me to be a strong, independent woman. Cor also writes about how mainstream feminism fails to acknowledge many important issues in her culture, like the complex ethics of arranged marriage and racism. She talks about how feminist acts look different for her as a Punjabi woman, like moving away from home to get a college education. I see this anomaly with my Venezuelan grandmother, who despite having a successful career in law, not common for a woman of her generation, still believes that a woman's place is to cook and clean and clear the table after dinner. This doesn't make her anti-feminist, it just means that her cultural values influence her view of what a strong woman looks like. The truth is, we cannot pin down a single definition for feminism. We must shed this idea of a one-size-fits-all definition because feminism looks different for everybody. Our identities and life experiences shape what it means to us, and the term is so much more nuanced than some may realize. The gap that exists between choice feminism and intersectional feminism is an excellent example of feminism's refusal to become a monolith. However, this gap can be dangerous as it can result in important issues being minimized or even fully ignored. Building a bridge between the different types of feminism does not mean to create a one-size-fits-all, but rather listen to each other's experiences and unite the movement in a way which everyone, not just women, benefit.